Uh, hi, everybody, and thank you for coming. I'm uh, David Gersten. I'm the director of Arts, Letters, and Numbers, and I want to welcome you all to today's conversation with uh, Ren Weschler and Jay Lynn Gomez. Uh, this uh, program is part of an ongoing uh, series of conversations titled Mr. Weschler's Cabinet of Wonders that Ren has uh, created for our Sunship exhibition in the 17th Venice Architecture Biennale. And I want to thank Ren for all that he's been bringing to this exhibition. It's been truly extraordinary. Um, and I want to welcome and thank Jay Lynn Gomez for joining us today. It is really an honor to have you here, Jay. Um, Jay Lynn Gomez, formerly Ramiro Gomez, was born in 1986 in San Bernardino, California, to undocumented Mexican immigrant parents who have since become US citizens. Uh, Gomez's work is known for addressing issues of immigration and making visible the invisible labor forces that keep the pools, homes, and gardens of Los Angeles in such pristine condition. I'm really moved and thankful that we can have this conversation today. Um, at the end of the conversation, we will have some time for questions from the audience. Um, and I want to ask you to please put the questions in the chat, and I will come back in at the end and share them uh, with, with Jaylen and, and Ren. So thank you for coming, and now I'll pass it to Ren, who will begin the program. Thank you. So I, uh, great to have you here, Jay. Thank um, you. As those of you who have been following my writing about this, Jay uh, was, when I first met him, was Ramiro. Uh, we will perhaps talk a bit about his transition uh, over the last few years uh, toward the end of the conversation. But there's so much to talk about before that, and, and I want to make sure we get to that, especially in the context of an architecture biennale. Uh, where so much of the architecture magazines, we'll get back to this, that you used to follow, yeah. conspicuously left out all the people who made those when those glass panes so gleaming and the carpets so clean and the everything, the whole lifestyle. They were always invisible and you've done an enormous amount to help render them visible. But I thought I'd tell the story about how I first heard about you. Uh, which is that I was in those days in Chicago a lot because I was running the Chicago Humanities Festival in those days. And so this would have been 2015. And whenever I was in Chicago, I would go to the uh, Art Institute uh, at some point and take my little walk, the, the Stations of the Cross, make sure that all my favorite things were there. And there would be, you know, the Surat and, and there was a particular Brock I liked. And then there'd always be this Hockney that I really liked off in the corner over there. And indeed there it was. It's the Hockney of the Wiseman's. Uh, it's, I think it's called American Collectors, but I've always thought of it as couple on the verge of a divorce, <laughs> as, as you can see. But in any case, it's, you know, we'll talk about that image later when you're doing your slides. But the point is, I saw it, and there it was. Everything was fine. And then I went to Art Expo, which was taking place, which was the big art fair. And I rounded the corner, and off in the distance, there the painting was again. And I said, what's, what's going on here? You know, and I approached it, and it was absolutely the painting. Then I got a little bit closer to it. It's not the painting. The artist in question had replaced the collectors with the gardeners. But otherwise, it was absolute, very, very well done imitation of the, of the Hockney. So I began talking with the dealer, Charlie James, who was your LA dealer, who was there. And he was exasperated. <laughs> he was telling me, he called you in those days the kid. And indeed, you were the kid. You were, what, what were you, you were 25 or something at that point. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he said, the kid is driving me crazy, he said. Um, He's been doing all sorts of things, but recently he's been doing this series of Hockneys where he replaces the figures in the Hockney with some of the workers in the house. And I can just sell those things forever. And just a few weeks ago, he told me he's made his point. He's not going to do any more of them. <laughs> and it's, well, is he crazy? I mean, you know, this kid, you know, he's coming from this poor family. You know, he could, he could make tons of money if he would just keep doing it. And, and it was just exasperating to him. And I have to tell you, I think I told you at the time, mm -hmm. that that was the moment I realized I want to write about you. That mm -hmm. to me was interesting. They, I mean, obviously the art was interesting, but the fact that you at that point 
had enough command of what you were doing. Excuse me, I have a croak in my throat today. But that you had enough command to realize that you'd made your point and you wanted to move on. In any case, I bought a ticket out to LA and we met in West Hollywood that first day in, at the park, at the very park where you used to be a nanny, as you'll tell us in a few minutes. Um, and we got to talking about David Hockney, who I've written about a lot. And you were saying, I hope that David Hockney doesn't think that I'm making fun of him and how important David Hockney had been to you as a, as a gay child and young man growing up in relatively macho Latino culture. Um, and I said, well, why don't we see him? Go see him. And we just got in the car. And I called David and he was happy to see you. And the two of you got on so well. We went up to, right past the houses you used to nanny in, up to his place in the hills. And you showed him on your iPad some of your images. And at one point you went off to the bathroom and David leaned to me and he said, he's really good. He's really good, he said. And he understands how the pictures work. He's got a great sense of that. And, and I, I said, I agreed. Anyway, that was the beginning. And within a year, we had done a book together, which is um, <laughs> this book, Domestic Seeds, The Art of Ramiro Gomez, as you were in those days. Actually, it's interesting because as you were actually in those days, as you are, you are Ramiro Jr., mm -hmm. your father was Ramiro Sr., so you went by J., Right. And, and there's a bridge here. You continue to be Jay Landage, but you're still Jay to me. So mm -hmm. if, you, if you don't mind, I'll call you Jay occasionally. Yes, <laughs> anyway, with that as an introduction, Ramiro, um, uh, sorry, Jay. Yeah. Wow. It, it, it uh, happens, Ren. It happens. <laughs> Jay, uh, tell us a bit of your story and maybe sh and show us some things too. Yeah. Um... It's interesting because so much about my life since that point has changed as everyone's seeing on the right. um, in the screen. Um, one of the things about being a nanny and being a sort of like child of immigrants and coming to this country to work in the very things that I didn't necessarily have the choice is exactly to do. I, I, it was a necessity to take a nanny job uh, in 2009 and work with this family and be this extra help, extra ha hands on deck for a family that was an entertainment industry family. Um, so much of that was difficult at the time because so much I felt at the time that I needed to become this sort of artist that just like, I don't know, and if anything, being a being a being a Latino and being a sort of male nanny was already a misnomer in that time, or just a sort of difficult situation for me. You're but an oddity. I was an oddity already, and I felt very strange looking at this picture, for example. By the way, before we go into this picture, let me just to give people background, and we can just talk about this quickly. Correct. You were, you were born in San Bernardino. Your parents were undocumented. They would later become documented by Ronald Reagan's amnesty. And he, it used to be that we could do this, but Correct. your father was a trucker. Your mother was a, a janitor at your very school that you went to. She was a janitor. And um, just very, very quickly, you were um, a soccer star, but you were also parenthetically a hemophiliac. And um, so that you were often in the hospital or in recovery, then you would spend your time drawing and you began to get into drawing doing that. that. And then you, you were so good that you got accepted to Cal Arts. You spent part of a year there. In some ways, it seems to be you were the very definition of the kind of thing people were talking about at Cal Arts in the abstract, you know, a, a, an othered Latino, you know, so forth and so on. But for various reasons, it wasn't really working, and you and and you quit that job, and you uh, you quit Cal Arts after one year, and you got this job as a nanny in the Hollywood Hills with a industry couple, as we call it, Hollywood industry couple, and you were the nanny for these two adorable uh, twins. Yeah, and looking at this picture, I 
it's startling actually. I, I'm currently dealing with a lot of this internal struggle of like recognizing a period of my life, recognizing myself, recognizing these children that at the time were just so young. They were, you know, six months old when I took over um, full time, but I had seen them from when they were six weeks old through that whole year, 2009. And as I said, I, I, I did struggle at that time as well, going from CalArts and failing at the time there um, and needing a job right out of school. I thought I was gonna just sort of move back home or move to my parents or move with my then uh, partner uh, in West Hollywood. And it was just a struggle, but my partner at the time, David Feldman uh, was an assistant editor for a big TV show and had been talking about this scenario of like me nannying for people and just sort of like pitching my name and somebody at his job, a fellow editor asked for immediate help considering they had these two young kids and needed a nanny immediately. Um, my name was suggested and I went and I remember interviewing with the six week olds just sort of like in little, you know, in their little cribs and just sort of like thinking, oh, wow, like I do have this childcare experience, but I don't know what this is going to take fully, you know, I, I just- Childcare you know, experience being that you have a whole cousinhood that you've been taking care of over the years. Yeah, and it's a strange feeling because like I said, they were so young and I just, I had all this family connections and experience with helping younger children in my family, my cousins um, and my, you know, little cousins, uh, children and all these little things that in the family, oriented levels it's like everybody pitches in my grandmother raised helped raise me and you know there's aunts and cousins that always help raise me and other cousins in our family so it was just always a family thing versus this was a job and this was like a family that I was meeting for the first time and it was hard to navigate that part at the time telling myself like okay this is a job in general but these are also living beings these are little children that are going to be my responsibility and like I said, being so young, being 23 years old at the time, I mean, I was just so overwhelmed in a way, but at the same time, also calmly kind of moved into this job. Um, and thinking about the scenario, like being in the Hollywood Hills and not necessarily understanding what it meant to see the gardeners and connections of, you know, people that look like my family and being in this neighborhood that was so pristine and well-kept, if you will. Um, you, once, you, once said to, you once said to me that the, that the Hollywood Hills are a Latino town from 10 o'clock to five o'clock in the evening. And then at five o'clock, the trucks go back down the hills and the limos come back up and it becomes an Anglo town. Correct. The next morning. And as you see, I mean, a truck like this with a gardener that I actually personally knew, Candelario, um, a truck like this moving up into the Hollywood Hills, you know exactly what they're there to do. And a truck like this leaving the Hollywood Hills, you know exactly what they did. I mean, it's just like, it's a it's a known thing in this area where, you know, people move in and out constantly out of this Beverly Hills community, the Hollywood Hills, West Hollywood. A lot of it is so well kept, like I said, but people don't really focus on it. They just accept the reality, um, whereas, I started wondering like, why are people coming up here working and such as people like myself that actually were living in the home um, versus they who were living elsewhere and just driving up on their days of work. And, and you've also talked to me, maybe you'll be getting this, but it's very important. The, the combination in your job of required intimacy uh, and responsibility as if you were part of the family. That's how it's, you know, in a good liberal house, oh, you're just part of the family, but you're part of the family that could just be fired on a moment's notice without cause as you're watching, not necessarily in your own household, but other people who've been working for time suddenly just disappear. There's no no conversation about what happened. That, that complication of that is also part of this, right? Correct. I mean, thinking about the women that were working with me, the housekeepers, such as these two women, um, on the left and on the right, the same woman in a different part of the house, just, I saw this every day, you know, and weekly there was a certain scenario where each of them would come. And at the time, considering I was the nanny living with the family, 
I was almost a, a state manager, if you will. I was the one organizing and connecting to them. So I wasn't just a nanny. Um, and it was, it's hard. It's hard to navigate a world where like, I'm able to speak Spanish. So communication with them was easy for me, but it also had to like certain times pass on information from the parents who were just requesting like if they could clean this or if they can do this or whatever. So I was also delegating and I was not comfortable at all times because I'm just so naturally bonded to people. Sometimes I'm over empathetic and I would just sometimes if they were requesting them to make extra laundry, whatever, I would do it myself, you know, and it was just a strange thing where I was pitching in with the laundry duties as well. Um, like I said, being a nanny was the title, but I wasn't just the nanny. I was identifying very much with these women and the men that were coming in um, and thinking about moments like this where, you know, the children that I was babysitting would be working and just, I was giving them a little play time to draw. Whereas at the same time, there would be a man outside cleaning the pool. Um, I remember Thursdays was usually the big, pile up of the pool cleaner, the gardener and the nannies coming in. So Thursday afternoon was always that moment to kind of like reflect on, okay. Here we are Thursday afternoon right now. <laughs> and, it, and it's a hard thing. And, and that, I mean, honestly, to reflect on that, thinking about how much this period of time is so long ago, but at the same time, as you just said, yeah, exactly. It's a Thursday afternoon and I'm, I'm having to understand that this very moment that we're talking and presenting this, this is happening. Um, when I think about that private space though, I didn't know how to talk about it. So I started kind of just quietly taking magazines that were sitting around the house and inserting the very people that I was seeing. So- By the way, let's talk for a second. A, a magazine around the house was Architectural Digest, for example, right? Or Vanity Correct. Project. Architectural yeah. Digest. Lux. So, so all you people there in Venice, all you architects, hello, we're looking at you. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's, it's interesting because this is the painting, and it's a small painting at that because it was from an ad directly ripped, as you see on the left-hand side of the screen, um, directly ripped as a sort of like response to what I was seeing erased. Um, this is also key to my practice where I could not paint that scene. I respond to the scene, but the scene without the figure speaks to this privileged space and the space that was being sold originally to people to say, hey, you can live this life of luxury. Whereas my response by inserting the woman cleaning in this case is almost like, hey, well, this also is part of it. You know, you can't just buy this beautiful lifestyle and home and not expect it to be maintained. Um, and that's where my work really comes from. It's this idea of commercial aspects that are selling furniture, that are selling the space. Yes, the architects out there designing the very homes and the very spaces that these people are going to have to maintain. And then at the same time, doing things like that specific ad there with Mitchell Golden, Bob Williams as the brand, and then adding the Maria um, or Al House and thinking about art history at the time and thinking of Manet's Olympia and including a woman that would not necessarily be laying on the sofa like that, but thinking, okay, how can I make artwork about these issues? And how do I bring in this element of, I, I guess, just sort of insertion of a character a person, not even a character, a person, because again, a title. Something, there's something wonderfully cheeky about the uh, her sitting there, uh, lounging there like Olympia, but that bucket lets us know who she is. And Correct. there's something almost subversive that she's going to sit there for a little while. Nobody else is in the house that she's going to do that and, and be there for us. By the way, so is this kind of a secret production? Or are you just taking the, is that you're, you're taking the magazines out for recycling and then you take some of them back into your room and you just paint these things uh, kind of quietly? Yeah, I, at the time, again, I was working. So I was actively feeling all these emotions and seeing all the people working around me and thinking questions like, why, why are they here? Who are they? Where are they coming from? What's what's this all about? And I just, I didn't know how to bring that up to the family for sure, or anyone else for that matter. So I would definitely take these magazines and then secretly paint them inside my living room slash bedroom area. 
um, that I had a private little furnished space that I myself um, as an employee had versus they didn't, you know? And it's just, I don't understand at the time why I was doing it, but I think it was more like a diary. Mm -hmm. um, these paintings were very important to me at the time. They were the ones that let me out of this emotion and these feelings. And I think back now that I've made a, you know, sort of like a, a change in a lot of ways, I, I very much identify with that period of time of hiding and secrecy, you know, and like not knowing how to communicate these things. Because again, I was afraid of losing the job and I didn't know how bringing this up would affect the family, you know, or affect the workers, or I didn't even think about it. But at the same time, making these paintings, I felt, in a way like I was making a protest. And I I didn't know how to describe the fact that it's not a protest per se in the loud sense. I wasn't standing picketing, but I was saying there's a lot of issues here. People being underpaid, people, you know, sacrificing themselves, being treated as secondary citizens, all these things. And at the same time thinking, well, how do I speak to a larger conflict when it's just so mundane and routine? And intimate. Um, and intimate. And intimate. Correct. I mean, these images are so intimate to me. I, I do value the fact that I was able to think in such a simple manner that the character, again, this character of a gardener is very film-like in a way, very much like creating a still of some type of scene or envisioning a scene in a movie that but would focus on them, you know? And it's interesting because the photographs that Architectural Digest publishes are as if they were movie sets. Always. Correct, I mean, it's all, all, all stage. And I think about that a lot where there is a photographer that's brought in and people are staging these scenes. You know, they are uh, fancy homes that some editor will say, hey, we would like to feature your home in our magazine. And like these gardeners and these people are coming in to maintain those spaces secretly, you know, and, and by the way, it's also the case that people, Hollywood people who look at the thing say, I want that scene in my movie. So a lot of Hollywood movies are shot in the scenes that are invented in Architectural Digest and, but always without the, uh, without the people who maintain them. Correct. And ironically, when there's like, you know, a family who's featured in the magazine, such as this scenario, and they decide to include donkeys and lounge around their pool without the actual figures that I'm talking about, it communicates one thing. They're, they're choosing to focus on themselves as a family in this pristine location. Again, in inserting donkeys, that just made no sense to me whatsoever at the time. So by including the figures of the pool cleaner and the nanny on the edges, I'm talking about the periphery. I'm talking about the, the hidden, the invisible, the kind of feelings that, again, in movies, ironically, so many times, the only time that you see anybody is in the background or, you know, movies like Blue Jasmine where Kate Blanchett's character is expecting a visitor and the visitor comes through the door where the housekeeper literally just stands there, opens the door and that's her whole role. No, no lines, no nothing. And Woody Allen featured that. And I, I think about that often how, yes, there's some movies that have tried to focus on the housekeepers such as Roma and Others, the help that brought up these issues from a past time and very complicated periods of our country. But I'm saying like, okay, why is Hollywood not bringing this up constantly when they're very much employing the very people? By um, the way, the, 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 the housekeeper and the pool keeper are no doubt the people who take care of the donkey too. Correct. And that's the thing. It's again, that was the choice that the photographers and the family made and the editors and the magazine made to include these donkeys. But again, it's like, who was and why were they featured? And it's like, when I think about my role as an artist, that's where simple things like this are not so simple. You know, this piece specifically, you know, was featured in an art fair where the very person, the man standing there who I guess runs this design firm saw this very magazine and was shocked, but at the same time, surprised and honored and inquired about the painting ironically. So it's like, I don't know. I, I think back to a period of time when I was making these on my own secretly without anybody understanding, without the art career, without none of that. And so for me, it was like a freedom. You know, I didn't have the fear of response from whoever I was lampooning or featuring. Um, again, if I think back to a period where 
on taking the covers and the very magazine like Lux and featuring these scenes, you know, on one end, a woman in the scene that didn't feature a housekeeper before or a nanny before, but the children were just lounging around watching TV as if nobody would be there. And I ironically worked in a home that looked just like the, mag the magazine where the children are sitting around watching this TV. So of course I'm gonna include a figure that I'm like, wait, I see it. Why doesn't everyone else see it? Mm -hmm. Or on the other hand, the self-portrait, which is the only self-portrait I did in the magazine series. Um, very rarely at the time did I feature myself, but as you saw in the first slide with the children in the baby Bjorn and the, you know, one child on an arm, that was my life. And so including myself on the cover in this case of Lux was a choice. I wanted to tell people like, look, I am an, at the time male quote unquote nanny and thinking about these emotions and these feelings, like I said, why was I working with this family and being a part, quote unquote, of the family versus other people were most certainly not. One of the things that's interesting, by the way, is that they are all faceless, which Correct. is a really interesting combination of showing something and then showing the facelessness of it in the showing of it. Ironically, facelessness is a part of my choices to kind of force the viewer to fill in the gaps themselves and think about how those featureless people aren't featureless. They're real people or based on real people, but I don't know who you've seen. So my idea of facelessness is almost sort of like a, a little subtle nudge for you to think back to who was a housekeeper that you've seen, who was a nanny or a gardener that you've seen, and how do you fill in the gaps? How do you fill in the eyes? Um, ironically, yes, sometimes I was figured based in the magazines, but at the same time, an ad like this Rolex ad that just had a time and of course it's selling this very expensive watch, a watch that was masculine, obviously presenting in a way, um, thinking about the man of the house, if you will, those like ideas of who's being sold this Rolex, why are they buying it and how much money they had to spend on a Rolex, ironically, versus pay their own workers and so when i wasn't making figure based painting let's make that I, clear what that says it says maria eight hours equals eighty dollars and there's a check for eighty dollars correct and that check in that uh uh note that little uh slip the pink slip that was very much how i i myself was paid sometimes um ironically just left on the counter for some reason not often was i paid directly especially if i was just babysitting separately from living with his family, um, the exchange was so impersonal. In some ways, I was waiting around for that check and other times I wasn't. Um, but meanwhile, I was tapping into that memory when I saw that Rolex ad and thinking about that irony of how much money somebody has to spend on a Rolex ad versus what they pay their help. Um, this definitely is a very important series, but at the same time, jumping around the idea of these magazines as quote unquote, a personal, small, intimate protest, I also realized that there was not a lot of people talking about it still, especially if I was hiding it in my own bedroom at the time. So I remember thinking, okay, how do I speak to this neighborhood? How do I actually talk to this idea of these issues and move away from the magazines and move away from the intimacy of a small little piece that I have to like either share directly with someone or talk to someone about it or post it at the same time on social media or some sort of exchange in that way versus like, how do I just exhibit in this very neighborhood? <laughs> so by the way, you've told me that this was the year that Banksy was in Los Angeles. And there was a lot of stuff about graffiti at the Museum of Contemporary Art and that you tried to do graffiti, but you're, you've are you been very well brought up and you just couldn't bring yourself to deface property. But this was your solution. Correct. And it's interesting you mentioned Banksy specifically because he was definitely an influence at the time with his movie Exit Through the Gift Shop. And the idea of street art was something I was definitely forming in my head as like a possibility for me, um, not being in the gallery at the time, not working from a, you know, MFA program, not doing any of those quote unquote uh, art career moves. I simply was nannying in a neighborhood and thinking, okay, I have this idea. How do I get away from this vandalism quote unquote thing and get into something more comfortable for me. I was not comfortable going into a Beverly Hills home and you know, we pasting something on somebody's home. At the same time, I couldn't. What was I gonna we paste on the hedge? I mean, nothing was gonna stick. So I had to figure out a different way. If I'm in Beverly Hills, 
there isn't really walls for you to plaster something, there's hedges. And so thinking about the idea of material at the same time, I was like, okay, if I'm gonna paint a figure, how do I make something out of nothing? And how do I describe these issues and how do I communicate? So it came naturally. I actually just needed a surface to paint on and found cardboard just lying around the neighborhood one time and created this series of cardboard cutouts, if you will. There are some great photographs of you foraging in the Best Buy in the trash can where all the plasma boxes are in the back and then you would take those and use those, for example, to make these. Correct. But at the same time, it's based on lived experience. So if I was in the neighborhood foraging for that cardboard, it was because I had just been in the neighborhood seeing somebody actually working. For example, in this case, a woman at a park, West Hollywood Park specifically, where I myself was nannying and taking these children to the park, I of course identified with that woman nannying and sitting on the lawn with a child. And so how do I reflect on it? And how do I honor it too? So by turning to the materials like cardboard that was so accessible and so easy to reproduce the painting on, I mean, again, having to create that at the, sign, at the time was just so natural to me. I know it's not a simple act, um, but it was just resource you know, and thinking, okay, I'm going to go right back to the very spot where this woman was and put the same cardboard cutout. And her. amazingly, people will look at the cardboard cutout in a way that they will not see the woman. Correct. But that's an interesting concept too, though, Ren. Don't you think it's because of a certain degree of guilt and there's a certain degree of violation, if you will, if you like stare at a person, right? So yeah. Yeah. I can't expect anybody to do that. That's, that's also where the creative part of me had to come out. It's like, okay, I also have these issues, but I also can't tell somebody, hey, just stare at this person that's a gardener or a nanny, you know, like that's not also the correct um, situation for me. So I needed to navigate a world where I'm like, okay, as an artist, I, I can't create paintings that are gonna allow for that space of contemplation. Um, and so if anything, thinking back to that period, as I said, I started realizing why I was doing it. And there's a big reason. I mean, my mom featured here in this picture is a custodian. She maintains a school. She's worked for years now at the same elementary school where she sees teachers come and go, principals come and go, students come and go. And yet she trucks on every single day um, despite her own physical frailers and, and fragility as she ages. It's it's something that she takes pride in, taking care of the school and maintaining this space for the children to learn. That's the heart. And thinking back to the period, as I was showing you the magazines and the cardboard cutout project, and just in general nannying, I remember my mom specifically telling me, I didn't come to this country for you to do the very job I do. I don't want you That's to- That's what she said about you being a nanny. She yeah. Said and like thinking about that moment where she said, that to me, and yet I still chose to take this nanny job responsibly, obviously, but regardless of her uh, her feelings in some ways, I was just, I remember thinking, okay, I know I may be feeling like I'm disappointing them, but I needed to do it. And my mom at the time didn't understand what the future held for me. She was just a concerned mother, but she was right. I, you know, I, I studied and tried to do things for myself that were not gonna always work out and yet, Here's a very intimate moment for me, being in my mom's office, taking her portrait, regardless of the moments at the time that were not easy that I was going through, just having a time to go and hang out with her. Um, ironically, this is a, a moment where I also, my mom knows about my artwork and I do remember thinking, I'm gonna make a portrait of you, so she posed for me. Um, but regardless, this is something that I show you to give a context into why, you know, um, One question there. At the time when you were first doing the draw, the secret paintings on the architectural digest cutouts and so forth, and then beginning to do the, uh, the cardboard cutouts, did you envision this as an artistic practice or was this a social commentary practice or was this a diary or because within a few months you will suddenly be recognized and you will have a gallery and so forth? Correct. I mean, I think, no, I, I feel, Ren, that I wasn't necessarily aware of what it meant. I just, I was acting on complete intuition and following daily scenarios. Yeah, if I made a magazine painting, for example, and shared it with someone else, and then that person started talking about it uh, in their classes at 
you know, at UC Santa Barbara were eventually getting online attention and getting interview requests and things like that. Uh, yeah, I was just simply acting on it. I, I, I know that my work turned into something very quickly that was out of my hands because I was commenting on something that's so deep. Um, and there's so many people that out there that started reflecting on what I was doing mm -hmm. in their think pieces, interviewing me, connecting. Um, I, I simply- By the way, one other thing to point out is that the, for example, when you would lean pieces against the hedge, the owners of the property would say to the help, well, you get rid of that thing. And that they and they often would get rid of it by taking it back to their own homes so that some of your earliest works are all over the barrio and so forth at the homes of the people who uh, and you enjoyed that. You enjoyed that idea that that was happening. Correct. I mean, I think back to who owns art. I mean, I think what you just saw through the cardboard series, especially those art pieces were left behind. Right. That was a painting made on cardboard that I didn't necessarily keep. I just put it up and then walked away. I recorded it for the time. I took photos and whatnot. But the point of that practice, especially the cardboard cutout practice, it was to let, let it go and let it be and just see what happens. Um, again, very much like street art in general. There's no there's no uh, maintaining it. There's no vitrine. There's no gallery attendant. There's no security guard. There's nothing like that. But in art museums, obviously, as you see on the screen in the case of LACMA, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, where I took a photo of a janitor and made a painting on canvas in this case, reflecting on the fact that my mom is a janitor, like I said, I think this painting specifically would be in a museum, for example, and yet the irony, you know, the who takes care of the art, who owns the art, all those questions come up in the series. And so as I move through these ideas and these images, I hope that the audience is understanding that there's, there's always a goal, but the material is dictated by the the idea at first. It's not the way that we're around. I don't try to force my material onto the idea. Um, I'm always speaking at the time, especially I was definitely speaking from a very uh, personal perspective and, and obviously relating it to art history. I was not by any means thinking, oh, this is an art practice. No, it was just simply like, I have this emotion, this feeling, how do I talk about it? So I made a painting. And in a way, sharing it and creating these art pieces is so different from like what most artists think about. Like, again, I wasn't doing an MFA program. So thankfully, this wasn't something that like was a think piece with all my fellow cohort or anything. It simply was me thinking, I live this life. This is my intersections. How do I then start making artwork about it? You know, um, again, a painting like this one, a very real moment that I took a photo of in a hallway at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Ironically, buildings that are no longer there, um, just reflecting on the ephemerality, you know, and like, again, if a woman was cleaning around a, a pristine art museum, no different than what my mom does at a school, it's like, how do I describe it, you know, and thinking, of, again, not just the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, but like other museums like the Broad in this case, where they're just so beautiful and, again, architecturally incredible, um, a facade like this where the Broad Museum is so prominent downtown now, but a figure walking across the facade like this, so small in scale, but so important to me was the goal, you know, and, and the juxtaposition there, the ironic part of a building that takes so long to make and so many people to design and all these things that are featured. At the same time, thinking of the people that are working in that very building, that's what my goal is always, is to share with people who are doing these very really awesome projects for, civically, but at the same time, socially, what is the responsibility of us? Um, when I think back to the art career, I moved forward now to a period where I was actually now working in museums, as you see with these paintings on canvas. And this was definitely a transitional point for me. I remember thinking, okay, I'm no longer a nanny anymore. I'm an artist. And if I'm being asked to exhibit artwork, how do I describe these things? You know, how do I describe the entertainment industry in a nutshell? And it's hard. I mean, images That's like Paramount this, Studios, the water tower is the Paramount about Studios. Paramount Studios, correct? Yeah. And like, how do I describe the entertainment industry and things like this where the actual hedges at Paramount Studios, you know, shield the person on Melrose, this very iconic avenue in Los Angeles where the studio is on. 
how do I talk about these issues? Ironically, a hedge came up in my mind at the time and I saw the real hedge with the water tower peeking out and the palm trees peeking out. And it's almost like, hey, who can see this studio? Who can get into this space? Um, I, this is a large scale painting. I, I can't really share with people the scale of these paintings all the time, but I, unlike the magazine, which is so small, this one being so big, six feet by 12 feet, it's like, it's imposing and it's an important thing. It's like, if I'm making this painting about Hollywood, I need it to be big in impact. You know, sometimes I work bigger and sometimes I work smaller. But like I said, in this case, compositionally thinking about the palm trees and the, uh, the water tower peeking out over this hedge at the same time, this male figure and a female figure on the left-hand side working together. Go I right, think going back to that one, by the way, I was struck by how he is holding his leaf below her like a lightsaber. Uh, and, the, and, the, and the green hedge is a screen. And it is like, he is like a star of that moment, but, but uh, Correct. And you it, saw him. It's interesting you bring that up because it is like a backdrop. It is a set. It, it, this was constructed. This is a piece of idea. It's not based on any one moment. This is not a person that I saw specifically standing like that in that very position in front of that water tower, you know, this is a set. I constructed this image, you know, thinking about the symbolism of the stepladder, thinking about the symbolism of the, you know, the, the trimmer, the hedge trimmer, thinking about the leaf blower, as you said, with a saber aspect. I also think about how much in this moment, making a painting like this one, the details started coming out a little bit, you know, but they weren't also fully rendered um, because at the same time, they weren't, they were the star of this, painting, but they also weren't featured in Hollywood. So it's like, how do I describe both their reality and their invisibility? Um, and doing that, by the way, is you are doing exactly what Velasquez did. I mean, you are constructing a scene that didn't actually happen like that. And over a period of time, you build it up. And uh, it's not a photograph, obviously. Correct. I mean, I think my work in museums and the, again, the janitors that work in spaces such as this one, the Denver Art Museum, where I was asked to be part of a show and I was invited and I was a, you know, sort of like curated artists versus my idea at the time thinking, well, if I'm gonna be invited to make a painting or paintings inside the Denver Art Museum, what do I wanna talk about? And what do I want people in Denver to think about? And so choosing to tell the curators I wanted to focus on the janitors or janitor in this space and make paintings around them. In this case, this wonderful woman named Lupita, who at the time was working for the Denver Art Museum, but technically also subcontracted for the Denver Art Museum. Um, ideas that I didn't think about at first, obviously going into the museum project, it was more a natural sort of like, okay, I'm gonna make paintings or whatever, but at the same time thinking, well, what does it mean for this woman who's letting me follow her around the museum and shadow her and talk with her and try to come up with some project? What does this mean for this woman to be pushing this cart outside of it in a space that is not hers, yet she maintains it? Or a space that technically doesn't really employ her, you know, the subcontracted- and That's important. The Denver Art Museum washes its hands of all those issues by just contracting to somebody else to come and take care of it. Correct. So it's not their issue. But again, this is an interesting thing. You know, you know the architects that create these spaces. I mean, the Denver Art Museum's architect is well world renowned, you know, but it's like, I think about how much- right, I believe. Is yes, it was Liebeskind. And it's interesting because so much about that idea, the focus on the museum's facades and the focus on the museum's artwork and all these things that are pristine. And yet the way, yes, correct, that they washed their hands completely in some ways, thinking that their issues are because they're making paintings or inviting artists like myself that are working, that they're completely not guilty in this scenario, and yet they very much are. Again, a woman like this who was employed by a subcontractor who then realized that she was, you know, she was like part of my art piece at the same time as me realizing that she's not part of this museum fully. Um, it was hard. It was hard to navigate this world where I was gonna start featuring her Meanwhile, ironically, during my period of that show and, and working with her and trying to figure out what I was going to do, she actually was let go. Um, the subcontractor, ironically, was changed. So the Denver Art Museum chose to work with someone else, thereby 
Lupita losing her job because a new contractor just wasn't going to work for her. And all the while I was like, okay, reflecting on this moment, how do I speak to this issue? So I decided to use the same image that I took a photo of Lupita and cast her in bronze and paint this on bronze, working with a wonderful uh, bronze um, foundry there in Denver and creating a project again around her and thinking, okay, what does it mean to be permanent and impermanent? You know, casting a cardboard cutout, the bronze itself is really, really detailed. And unfortunately you can't really see the detail here, but it, the, the, uh, the foundry was able to capture the ridges of my cardboard. Um, I hand painted the surface of the bronze. So it was very reminiscent of my cardboard cutout, but at the same time, having it installed outside, directing the museum to install it outside where it's unprotected and was vulnerable and eventually did get vandalized and whatnot. Now talk about that for a second. This blows my mind. Ironically, the piece was constructed to be outside and I had to let the museum know. And of course they had to go jump through lots of hoops to get it anchored and secured. And I, at the same time, had to work out contracts. There's a lot of behind the scenes that people don't understand about how difficult it is for ideas like this to come to museums, especially when the museums themselves are trying their best to kind of like, not so subtly push the idea away, you know, or, you know, they might not say no to this idea, but they will say, hey, we don't have the money to fund it. So where are you going to get your money from? You know, it's like, that is how these issues get hidden sometimes. And what happened to the piece? This piece specifically at one point, because I was forcing the museum to keep it outside, the museum would tell me there's no security for it. Sorry, if anything happens to it, we're not liable, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, uh, this piece one night was vandalized by some person uh, who decided to come directly. And there's, uh, there's security footage, ironically, of a person at like one in the morning driving a bicycle to the very piece, just directly to it, and then pushing it with all its might. I mean, it was secured to an extent on this surface, but with body weight, this piece eventually got pushed over and bent. Um, it's bronze, but it was still vulnerable, like I said. Uh, so yeah, it was vandalized in that way. And once the museum let me know, I literally had to go through, again, a bunch of hoops to get it reinstalled. What does it take for somebody to need to knock over so somebody online is just asking, this is not a painting. The thing you were looking at there was the br uh, piece that he made of bronze. It was a br standing bronze. And somebody in the middle of the night felt the need to come and knock it over. That's Correct. And again, it's like, would that things. person would that person attack the very gender that I focused on? I don't know. You know, th these issues are important. And I don't know if somebody directly attacked this painting specifically I, it's just based on whatever i saw on this uh, security footage but um for them to go directly to it at one in the morning that meant intent and there is a certain degree of vitriol and and poisonous atmosphere this is also 2016 17 around the time of a uh, certain president's uh, inauguration and so it's like it's hard not to describe the period of time where there was. Know, she, she, she's clearly Latino, so she must be a rapist, I guess, right? Or something. I don't know. And it's just clearly some type of like poison in the atmosphere that must have led somebody to to vandalize my piece. But at the same time, that's what art does, you know. Um, ironically, thinking about the issue that I had mentioned of the subcontractor, the bronze was outside, but inside, I decided to do this large scale sort of assemblage, if you will. Um, using the very materials in this museum, such as trash bags, and then incorporating certain things. Uh, ironically, when I was featuring um, Lupita and shadowing her before the project even came together, she was walking around the museum at the same time that they had a women in abstract expressionism show. Um, and so I featured the very title women in it with abstract expressionist gestural painting on the surface of cardboard. I bent that cardboard, I ripped it. I, I did so much to that piece that I was interested in like kind of expressing something, um, figuring the cutout, as you see in that very center, that's, that's essentially the cardboard cutout that I used to then cast the figure in bronze, but leaving that empty space so that the white wall shows through. The cutout itself, sometimes a silhouette, I would throw away the cardboard pieces, for example, or let them go when I did the figure, but I realized that the silhouette, the negative space was also the art, you know? Um, 
And then featuring things like the Denver Art Museum's logo, CMS and integrated cleaning services were the two subcontractors that were switched out. Um, so for example, Lupita was working for CMS, whereas they switched, the Denver Art Museum switched over to in integrated cleaning service. And I remember at the time making this painting, I was told that I couldn't feature those logos. Again, other ways that the museums and their companies can subversively try to push art away. And I remember reflecting on it and going, wait, but why is it okay for pop art and Campbell's soup cans to be so prominently featured? So I did it, I still did it, you know? Um, and the big, the big thing specifically with this piece was that Lupita, when she was working at the museum, and as I said, I was shadowing her during this time that the Women in Abstract Expressionist show was on, she walked into the gallery and left her push cart outside of the gallery space and only walked in with gloves. And I remember asking her, hey, why did you leave your cart outside? And why are we just walking around now? She goes, well, I was told by the museum I couldn't push my cart in while there's guests, while there's uh, visitors in the, in the gallery space. So she could only walk around and pick up whatever trash is on the floor and then bring it outside. You know, she wasn't allowed to bring the trash bag in. And so what did I do? I bring the trash bag into the museum, <laughs> the very gallery space. Um, that was me and Lupita at the very art opening gala, exhibition gala with her daughter, you know? And so this is where the heart of my projects are. It's yes, one thing to feature and make a painting about a person, but it's a real person nonetheless. And I remember her not working at the museum anymore, but specifically thinking, oh wait, this invite to the gala is important. This is part of the project too. And her showing up with a stunning dress um, and her daughter in a stunning dress and just being free to roam around the, the very space that she had to work at before. That's part of my project. I get very emotional thinking about this moment because I remember how frustrated I was with these very issues that again, as an artist, I was speaking to and ironically being invited to paint about. And then meanwhile, feeling that there's still issues happening. It might not be the same as a domestic space, but an art museum, you know, has their own difficult, if you will, intersections. Again, board members and people that have their own, you know, uh, interests at, at heart and not the interests of the people. Um, it reminds me, by the way, there was a wonderful, there was a book back in the 70s, the early 70s, of photographs of graffiti in Los Angeles with, in the early days when there was all this fantastic graffiti and somebody went around taking photographs. And in the book, without any commentary whatsoever, they included the wall, the inscribed wall with the names of the contributors to the LA County Museum. You know, yeah. Right. And how the, how the museum's flank is tagged with the names of Robert Hope and, yeah. <laughs> and, and Bing Crosby or whatever, the, whoever all the people were. And, and it just put them alongside, side by side, talking about the different kinds of tagging, which was. Yeah. Funny. And again, this isn't, this isn't tagging per se, but it, it felt very much like that to, to create a whole series of paintings around this real person and inviting her and having her see this artwork, you know, in person. It, it reminds me of a moment in time when I remember being like so overwhelmed because I was thrown into a career now of art about these issues. And I remember thinking if I, if I speak to this, you know, in any other way, I, I wouldn't have a career, but it's like, I, I think because I found my mediums, you know, and if I find ways to kind of create reflecting in the society, I, I think people are getting a sense of, of the importance of this. And, you know, despite the measures in place to silence voices like ourselves and thinking about moments like in the previous painting uh, on cardboard versus this one featuring uh, the nannies in New York uh, for a show I did at PPOW. Um, you know, again, there's so many differences between Los Angeles and Denver and New York, but at the same time, there's similarities. Um, By the way, in the picture, just so people know, the uh, nannies are cardboard and the, ba and the babies that they're taking care of are just painted. And notice the babies have faces, uh, but the nannies are kind of, uh, again. Correct. Again, this is a large scale painting. This was featured at Art Basel, Miami Beach in 2018. And I remember thinking my show at PPOW um, was an important moment my first big New York show. And so I remember thinking at the time of how do I describe the issues at play? And again, being a visitor to New York and going to places like Madison Square Park, that's the park featured in this painting. 
um, where the nannies are actively moving around the city like this um, and making a painting about it, you know? And yes, using materials. Again, at this point, I started combining my canvas and my cardboard together and reflecting on the issues, thinking about the cardboard cutouts directly applied to the surface of the canvas. By the way, is, is the butterfly there in the middle, is that a car cutout or is that- It a... is. That butterfly in the middle is actually a cardboard butterfly. And it was for me to symbolize, again, the connection to the nanny's um, transformation, ironically. Um, sorry, I get very emotional thinking about a painting like this because it was a segue for me. It was a period of time when I remember thinking, okay, I'm working with cardboard and canvas and magazine and all these ideas of collaging in different ways, but at the same time, the transformations that I had been going through, um, the period of time that I felt, you know, um, overwhelmed with the responsibility of being an artist and a career and thinking like, you know, this isn't, this isn't an easy thing to paint about. It might seem like it, but it's not. And how do I start using symbolism? How do I reflect on very, very small moments of beauty? Mm -hmm. How do I think about nature and cycles? And again, ephemerality, how do I think about life? People that are there for a moment and then are gone the next. How do I think about change? How do I think about children? How do I think about the very much important lessons that a person like a nanny will impart on a child who may never remember that person in their life? Hmm. And then again, being at our Basel Miami Beach, how do I talk about the very issues and then constantly still figure ways? The painting was featured on canvas in the very booth, very prominent, lots of visitors, lots of eyeballs. But then again, people working around the convention center with their green uniforms, cleaning, maintaining that space. I remember telling the gallery, you know, yes, I have this show and this painting on the wall, but I would like to work from this very gallery booth. So making cardboard versions of these people that are working at the booth during the fair and giving it to them directly was a moment as well. It's, it's how I process, you know, my painting being so expensive and sold to one person or one collector, it limits who can own art. And by the way, we haven't talked about this at all, but we, you and I have talked about it over the years, just the irony of people who buy the painting for a lot of money, put it on their wall uh, in their house. Things get very meta very quickly and very strange. And, and Yeah, and I think I, I think through this this slide, I think it's it's meta for me too. I have to reflect on this time and it's not easy. You know, I I have to think about like again, this was Art Basel Miami Beach um, when it was still actively, you know, with no mass, no nothing pre-pandemic and it feels like a lifetime ago, you know? I, I do create art, like I said, for shows and exhibitions, but at the same time, how do I get away from this frustration that as an artist, some people that I want to own the artwork can't. So again, making the cardboard cutouts and making cardboard paintings in this case, where ironically people were asking, can I buy these at the very fair that I told people, no, these are given to the janitors and creating this idea, you know, um, of exchange. Um, that was a project called Just For You. Um, it was recorded. I actually have to work on all the elements of it with David uh, Feldman, my, my partner, um, who recorded all of that Art Basel Miami Beach gift exchange experience. You know, again, it's one thing to, for you as an audience to see the pictures, but it's another thing for you to see what I actually did and these very people and their voices and their, their response to my gifts that were so surprising, you know? Um, you know, Ren, I think that my experience at an art fair, as you have seen yourself as an artist, most people don't wanna be there. Most artists don't wanna be in the exchange and the commercial side of the art world. But I, I know that I need to be in those spaces because those are where the intersections lie. You know, those collectors have housekeepers and nannies at home. And how do I keep talking about this issue or these issues um, 
in spaces that are not meant for art making, they're meant for art selling. Yeah. Going back to the cardboard cutout, Ren, I know that we were gonna talk about these other issues and these paintings, but I wanna definitely connect to art history as you have seen in your own work and your own experiences, these Velasquez references that are there. And yet when I actually fully embraced the reference and came home and did a cardboard project after seeing the real Meninas in person in Madrid and being inspired to create a Meninas cutout, right? Um, I know you can tell the audience about this, but it, it's a strange feeling about connecting to famous works of art and like not wanting to be karaoke essentially. What's so you funny know? about this, by the way, is that you are the only person I know who noticed in Las Meninas that the princess, the Infanta, the um, the princess was be that basically the ladies in waiting on either side are kind of the help in a way. They're making sure that she looks good, and and then what's so wonderful for me about in this particular photograph is that you know the kind of house behind that gate is a house where all the seven year olds are treated as princesses. You know, and, and <laughs> Correct. dress up as princesses, and 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 so it's just really the, the layers that are just fascinating in this in this. Yeah, and then again, taking the photo, putting this up in person, seeing people passing by, reflecting on this very temporary moment, asking themselves, like, what is this person doing? Is this art? What What do you do? Like, I remember thinking at the time, going into Bel Air, this is the Beverly Hills Bel Air area. So again, a very pristine, beautiful neighborhood. Um, and thinking about these issues, like I said, I was inspired by the real painting and thinking, okay, well, I can't make the whole painting here but I can focus on the very important part and that's the Meninas, you know, and calling this Beverly Hills Las Meninas, you know, it's like, it's reflecting on a period of time, you know, and, and thinking about the differences between an Infanta and a princess in Madrid and the very real new Meninas, you know, and, and how do I intersect those years? Um, By the way, try to go through the slides in the next 10 minutes. So we have a few minutes yeah. to talk and then open it. And of course. Again, thinking about real people, this is in Mexico City with beautiful murals by Siqueiros and other artists around in Orozco and Rivera and thinking, okay, somebody's cleaning up in the museum, you know? Thinking about the ideas of exchange between muralism and the Mexican borders and the ideas of people moving through this painting specifically being done in the desert of, you know, Arizona and thinking about not necessarily workers, but people that are migrating and you know, creating a piece that again, maybe eventually we can share with the audience the, the short documentary around this called Los Olvidados, The Forgotten, but you know, how do I deal with these bigger issues? How do I keep moving this idea of not just people working, but why are they working and what do they sacrifice? You know, the real engagement of migration and issues that again, in Mexico, for example, coming from that country to here is not an easy trek at all. And like, you know, worldwide, you see the refugees and ideas of people moving through, you know, I think back By the to way, how I just let's slow down quickly here. It, is Los Olvidados online? Is it is it available or it is it's um, so spell it out so people will know how to look for it. Uh, Los Olvidados is L O S O L V I D A D O S. Um, ironically, like the famous movie. Um, but most notably, not that movie. Uh, it's called Los Olvidados, The Forgotten. And David um, Feldman. And it's directed by David Feldman, correct. And so people should just go on and take a look look for it, but continue yeah. on what you were saying. Well, again, like I think back to my art making and like, again, a painting and a documentary about Los Olvidados, but then at the same time, going to a day labor center and creating uh, workshops for day laborers to create their own art on cardboard mm -hmm. is an important thing, you know? And it's like, going back to these issues and thinking about how much my practice moved between exchange and art making and other times, you know, thinking about these, these moments of time of like, you know, where I'm creating, no matter where in the world I am, I'm thinking about these, these very people, you know, and, and bringing up these issues again, through these materials, um, where it feels like to me, I think, that series specifically, I wanted to come back to it again, going into other series. And like I said, the magazine series back to the material, 
it, it it changes and it doesn't, you know? And then moving into the pool again, moving into the ideas of the worker. Um, it's interesting, Ren, because this is where we started essentially, right? And as we're ending through, this is where you're talking about the moments of key things intersecting with David Hockney's A Bigger Splash and the movement that I had, you know, to then bring in my own versions of it. Um, you call this piece Thursday afternoon, right? Originally it was called Thursday afternoon because of that job and intersection of my job. Uh, eventually though, it went from Thursday afternoon to no splash, <laughs> which was <laughs> the simplest title actually and the most powerful one at that. Um, because again, thinking about the scale, the differences between the original Hockney and my own version and thinking about how I could create these, Here's the book. these scenes again, without the karaoke component, um, the painting that you had reflected on that brought us together and, yep. and thinking about David's, you know, Hockney's intersections with these collectors and these people, whereas I focused on the gardeners, you know, and, and updating it in a way um, to scale in this case, right? Um, I don't know. I, I think that the audience could understand a lot of my imagery has similarities, but at the same time, I reference a lot pop art. Ellsworth Kelly is a reference in this case with a famous building called Paul Smith and the branding of Paul Smith is so noteworthy here in Los Angeles that meanwhile, people actually maintain that same building. <clears throat> Again, for the audience being aware of these things I think is very important to me, you know, because again, I, I think I make art for- That is a painting, right? This is not the painting. This is actually the photograph- The photograph, wow, okay. Of a real person maintaining that pink wall. And wow. it eventually did become a painting, friend, <laughs> which ironically, you, you definitely recognize. Right. Um, some of these other paintings, like I said, I'll go through the magazines again. They intersect with art making. They intersect with these moments. Jeff Koons, again, balloon dog in New York City's uh, amazing buildings or whatever to me. <laughs> but at the same time, walking across during a snowstorm and seeing the person cleaning right outside of the balloon dog, you know, it's like, how much money is that painting or that sculpture worth versus how much money is that person getting paid? Yeah. Um, my New York series, for sure, again, I wanted to reflect on this because so much of my artwork is connected to California and my home in Los Angeles. But, you know, there's series like this where taking restoration hardware, including myself in that background, very Velasquez-esque, of course I'm referencing these things, you know? And, and meanwhile, the dark palette for New York City, for example, versus the brighter palette for Los Angeles paintings, those are very much intersections. Those are like the yin and yang to me. Um, it's not a noteworthy thing usually to tell people like, well, you know, I have a, a side that is very, you know, difficult to describe, uh, but it's, it's more of a awareness of like how much the grittiness of a city like Los Angeles or uh, of New York is, you know, on the surface versus Los Angeles's grittiness is hidden and masked. <clears throat> This is towards the end of the, the presentation, Aram, but um, again, the New York City paintings, not necessarily always about labor, but again, people going to an English language school and thinking about how these figures moving through these spaces, like again, on material like cardboard, talking about these issues, bringing up, you know, generational differences, graduates that are, you know, working or going so to you school. You put this one up during graduation day at UCLA, correct. And showing the, the people who are the gardeners and their child is graduating. With a diploma that says juntos, together. You know, that's talking about the sacrifices parents make for the children. And again, issues where, you know, people are graduating, but their families are either deported or not around for their ceremonies. Again, in the case of my uncle, who was deported from the U.S. to Mexico, missed out on his son's graduation and his other son's uh, inclusion in naval school and yet making a painting about it you know and how do I reflect on that uh, there he is in, in naval school the naval yeah that, no yeah. and like I said this little painting right here goes into the more recent things that I've been doing in in quarantine smaller more impressionist based paintings and I think where I will definitely 
end with this is the very real scenario that I'm transitioning as a person into a woman that I've always understood but hid. And again, ironically, hiding magazines from my labor, uh, from my work scenarios or hiding my personality fully from my family and my friends and my career. It's, it's something that I'm realizing now needs to keep me moving and growing. Um, yes, I focused on labor in spaces like these buildings and these homes and museums, but what about me? And I think where I'm at, painting very real moments in my life, my femininity, my, my life. Describe what this is. This is really beautiful. And coming together to a moment where I made a painting about a child with fairy wings, a boy specifically looking at their parents sleeping. The title of this painting is Boy Playing While His Parents Are Sleeping. And this began to show up about two years ago in your shows. I should mention, by the way, some people have been writing, you know, where can we get in touch with your works? Charlie James Gallery, Charlie James Gallery in Los Angeles certainly is a place to start. But anyway, keep yeah. going. No, and again, I, I think I'll leave the image here and finish with this painting because, yeah, this is, for me, Ren, a reality to me. I, I don't know exactly where my career is moving to, but again, just like I live my life as a nanny, kind of exploring these big issues and like finding finding ways of speaking about difficult issues. I'm starting to learn that I needed to move forward and move, move to the intersections. Yes, I'm focusing on labor still. Yes, Ramiro Gomez will always be a part of my artwork and career and personal development, but it's like Jay Lynn, as I am, as I've been, is someone trying to describe big issues again. This painting, again, very special because it was right before the pandemic. It was my last show before the pandemic. And it's the last thing I think I've really been able to fully make. Um, the pandemic's been very difficult for me to make new artwork, but um, I don't know, you know, using those fairy wings myself for a Halloween costume that Ironically, at the time I made this painting, I just decided to put on the painting itself. Um, it's both well, a self Those are the very fairy wings you used for a Halloween costume that year? Correct. Uh, this is October of 2019. So I used those fairy, fairy wings for a costume and then I made the painting right around the same time. So it's both a self-portrait and a sort of like nod to each of my series. I mean, the bright lavender color, the flat surface, the figures themselves being workers who in some of my previous paintings would have been faceless. But here, a temporary moment of respite. That's literally where I'm thinking right now. That's, I've been thinking a lot more about how much more can I say about these issues? And, and at the same time, I'm like, well, you know, these moments that I learned to hide, these learn these moments where I learned to be connected to my family and the intimacy involved in like living my life um, separate from this art career, you know? And I think that that's, that's a bigger scenario now. Like I need to talk about this, this sort of like reality to my, to my life as a trans woman. Mm -hmm. So. It's interesting, by the way, of bringing things full circle. And in a minute, we're going to open this to questions. So David, start getting ready to ask us questions. Uh, but uh, I had a conversation with Charlie James recently, and he was, uh, yeah, there's there's the book that we did several years ago, and it's available, uh, Domestic Scenes, The Art of Ramiro Gomez. I'm looking forward to someday being able to do the, the art of Jay Lynn, but talking to uh, Charlie, he was saying, why isn't he working? Why isn't he doing things? He's not doing things right now. And I said, you know, give him breathing space. Give her, oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> One of the things I really like about talking to you is that you're, you're generous in terms of those mistakes. But anyway, I'm sorry. But it's okay. give, her, give her room and that it's not unlike you to spend a long time figuring out but I think it's going to be worth it because I suspect that you will find ways of dealing with this transition you're going through 
that will be as powerful and as evocative as, as clearly you have been with the other stuff. And uh, so anyway, I've been watching chat, things coming up with how much people are enjoying it. Maybe there's some questions people want to ask. David, you there? Yes, hi. I'm here. Ah, <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, thank you so much. I Oh, there I am. <laughs> really moving, beautiful. Um, I, I, I feel like I learned something about what sometimes we think of as institutional critique in, in the art world. Um, and you know, and I'm going back to Kantaka, you know, lots of different ways that that's been thought of. But I think there's something extremely powerful in the fragility, the strength of fragility, let's say, that you're engaging and the way in which the fragility of strength, strength of fragility uh, becomes something you know, it's almost like that moment when when Ren thought, you know, the, the, the painted wall was the painting, you know, and there's this kind of slippage. Because in fact, there is paint on a wall, right? The big, the big wall was painted. Yeah. And I think you're playing with that in lots and lots and lots of ways with the Las Meninas, of course, with the cardboard, with the, you know, that the whole ambiguity of, um, even the little girl's dress that the mother brought in and, and the, the, that relative to Las Maninas' dress. Um, so I think that there's a social political dimension to introducing the vulnerability and the strength of your fragility into the work. And I really deeply appreciate that. Very moved. Thank you. So, um, so thank you. Um, yeah, the ephemeral too, the, the, the ephemeral, ephemeral nature. What a move to make the bronze, take the cardboard, make it bronze when she's let go. I mean, you know, yeah. <laughs> if anybody yeah. didn't get that. <laughs> it, it, it's playing with the impermanence and permanence for sure in front of a museum, <laughs> you know, and there's so much art making that like, you know, will get lost to time. So a bronze is definitely important for me to be able to then have some type of lasting version of this cardboard cutout series, you know, because we, I, I really don't know how long those will last. I, I doubt very much into the amount of time that some <clears throat> bronzes will. So, yeah, yeah. You know, just I'm going to share very briefly, just as a, on a personal note, I want to say I grew up in trucking. My family is all truckers. We build trucks, and that, and, and you know, it's a world. I mean, yeah. the world of you know the, the the people the the characters that i grew up with uh, you know <laughs> you know yeah. uh, brewer and fat jack and you know <laughs> johnny and burner and everybody you can imagine and um, the radio conversations between them yep i know <laughs> my dad tells me all the time about his car his costco truck driving buddies and it's just like <laughs> well yeah, it's, it's a special world yeah. and very you know few people in the art world know much about it there's, yeah. you know, there's a kind of, there's a, there's the divide that you're describing, the invisibility is something that I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about because, you know, I, the colorful characters and the intensity of knowledge, to be honest, craft and knowledge that I grew up in really just disappears when you get to the New York arts. I mean, you know, it really, you know, it, it's, and also there's a stigmatization of craft, of that kind of knowledge because it's associated with the working class and you no know, you know it's associated with uh, with pop with less money and 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 there's lots of kinds of knowledge uh, and I'm talking about knowing how to do things <laughs> like knowing how to fix pipes and stuff but also just knowledge of human character knowledge of, of human interaction that all gets kind of sanitized away because of the stigmatization um, and so I just wanted to share that uh, share that with you because I was I could sense a lot of that in what you were talking about. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay. Some questions uh, I have coming had coming in. Uh, actually, the one. Dave, 
Oh, sorry. Could I jump in to just ask something really quick? Oh, absolutely. Go ahead. Adriano, okay. coming to us from Athens. Go ahead. Coming from Athens. And every yes. time you say Athens, we should say Greece as well. It's not Athens, Georgia. Sure. It's even I don't think anybody than... thinks it's Georgia. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, okay, so first of all, Jay, thank you so, so much. This was so brilliantly moving. I mean, honestly, this was one of my favorites in the past six months, if I'm even allowed to say that. Uh, there's a couple of things that I'm thinking about, and I wanted to ask you something about the Hockney series, but now you were just mentioning, again, the um, this bronze versus kind of cardboard predicament. Um, and then I also, you know, remember you talking about the difference between museum collector and then the janitors or the people depicted in those cardboard paintings that you wanted ultimately to, to gift these uh, to. Mm -hmm. So the, the transiency is actually linked, um, I, I'm now thinking to the kind of gesture of, of gifting, right? As opposed to, you know, the kind of permanence and almost sacred um, monumentality that a work adopts in a museum that is uh, preserved in a way that is almost scary because it withstands a testament of time in a way that doesn't feel human or, or natural. So, you know, I remember at Cooper when we used to draw Sue Gosso, who was one of our drawing teachers, uh, and one of the giants at Cooper would always yell, don't draw on newsprint because they will go extinct in a couple of years, you know, especially if they're exposed in the sun. But then again, there was something quite inviting about that medium because it felt so personal. You know, it's almost like talking to someone over candlelight where it really just only allows for a couple of faces to gather around that tiny source of light. Um, so it was just something that I wanted to throw out there. But then I, I, I did have a question. I don't want to be one of those people that throws around three or four questions, but I am going to do that. <laughs> one is... Uh, for for Ren, who um, Adriano Scarpetti people is our tech guy. Our tech <laughs> stuff comes. This is the world we live in today. Our tech guy <laughs> is Athens, Greece. But go ahead, ask me a question. <laughs> so okay, so first of all, I'm going to ask both of the questions, and then you guys can decide how to answer those. But you mentioned Ren before um, that while the 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 body of Jay's work fascinated you, it wasn't until they stopped producing those very paintings that um, they were actually getting claimed for that you decided to, to write on them. So that actually moved me quite a bit. And I wanted to see if you could talk a little bit about what um, that is, what moved you about that gesture, you know, of, of I don't want to call it quitting. I mean, it was like very intentional right, kind yeah. of, yeah. yeah. Um, Do you want to ask yeah, I'll, I'll just I'll just ask Jay the next question after after that. But why don't you go ahead? Sorry. Okay. So basically, what moved me? I, I mean, it was very funny. Charlie, I think, at that moment was as a fellow art person saying to me as an art critic, "Isn't this exasperating? Can you imagine this guy would do this? What the kid? What what am I going to do with this kid? He doesn't know. He's 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 hit he's hit gold as a dealer. I can tell him that. And as many of us he does from now on, I can sell them immediately. There's such demand, but he just won't do it. He says he's made his point and. That was the moment I realized that I was dealing far from, I mean, far from this being a flash in the pan. Uh, this was a serious artist, a really wise old soul at the age of whatever he was, 27, 28, whatever he were at that point. And that that was interesting. I mean, all the art was mm -hmm. interesting, but that was really interesting. And so that's just when I decided to do it. And I think it's, uh, and it, it comes full circle. Uh, to the conversation I had with Charlie the other day, just let, let Jay be, uh, you know, yes, he's, uh, she's not producing right now, but I have a feeling she's really wrestling with things and that uh, there's nobody I would rather hear from about all this than Jay. And uh, we'll see what happens. So what's your other question? Which is, and yeah, I'm actually gonna bounce right off and then I'm gonna let everyone else, but this is, I promise, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop after this, but I did wanna throw that question in and bounce right off of you, uh, uh, Ren. Um, you said, you know, there's no one better to talk about Jay than, than Jay right now. And I, I, what I find so interesting about the Hockney series and every other one that sort of toys with this idea of the copy is that while the, the, 
the scene is repeated almost identically, the canvas and 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 the uh, the subject matter get kind of reactivated anew by replacing the subjects, and it kind of rewrites the reality of that painting, um, both the one that it it represents on the canvas and in the museum also. So it does so with 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 wit, obviously, and and social commentary, but it also feels like it's kind of giving like the subtle nod to like to Duchamp, you know, in the copy of the copy. And I wonder if this is something that brings for you, Jay, the question into question, the idea of, of authorship, like the rewriting of a story that becomes the writing itself. Yeah, um, I love how you're framing it. Authorship is actually the word that I would use and it's also a complicated word. Um, one thing I didn't know, I didn't really highlight as I was moving through the images, the magazine series, the cardboard paintings, the cutouts, um, into the canvas work, I never sign on the front. Um, and I've been asked that before. It's like, where's your signature? And collectors often will be like, hey, this painting is not signed. Can we like get the sign? Um, and it's hard to describe. I mean, I will often, yes, with canvases, I'll sign on the back. I'll usually write either the title or the year and then my signature on the back. With cardboard cutouts, I have done like my name and just sort of like a little bit of a signature on the back of those if I let them go. Uh, but oftentimes I don't. Uh, and in the magazine series, exactly no signature whatsoever. Um, the signature only comes, maybe sometimes as the title on the back. Early ones I did do Gomez on the front, but I just didn't feel right about it because it's not, it's hard to dis describe what is authorship. It, um, I never really feel and I've never really felt in most of my series that focuses on domestic labor, I've never really felt like this is an image I constructed completely by myself. I've lived the experience and I take photos of real people out there as like sort of like a starting point and then I kind of collage it and intersect. So it's not like it's coming out of nowhere to me, you know? And so authorship has become very difficult for me to say. And I think that that's how I will answer. It's that I don't always feel the ability to write my last name, like in art history, as we've all been taught, Picasso, you know, you're talking about Duchamp. I, I think about that all the time, the irony of me being a figurative artist, but at the same time, I'm definitely in conceptual realms. Mm -hmm. Or you said Hantaka earlier um, in this chat, um, but it was like a theme where I saw Hantaka's work in the Reina Sofia Museum in Madrid, and this was like, obsessed with the fact that somebody could create all these issues without just actually making it, like just simply putting out these email or these notes and whatever. And, you know, it's under the word Hakka and Hans Hakka, but it's like, who owns those things and what's what's the name? Um, and then meanwhile, the even more subtle layer, but not so subtle because I, I've said, I've focused on this labor that is very much maintaining things like the entertainment industry here in Los Angeles um authorship also implies uh like i am the sole creator and in mm. art history i've been really wrestling with this idea of how the name is singular jeff coons did not physically sculpt his sculptures though so you know i have to navigate a world where yes maybe i'm making these paintings in my case by myself in some ways but you know those canvases are being stretched by people that i'm working with the bronzes, like I said, was a foundry uh, called Silo Workshop in Denver. So like, I have to wrestle with this idea of uh, title and um, credits, you know? And I oftentimes think about how entertainment industry movies, they don't shy away from it. They, there's a whole credit scene at the very end, you know? But the art world does, you know? There is no credits in, in the title of a person's painting, it's singular. It's as if you were to say though, George Lucas is the only maker of Star Wars and that's it, just George Lucas, you know? Or Steven Spielberg is the only creator of any of his movies. I don't know, it's, it's irony that I start wrestling. So that, I guess that's how I'll answer it. It's, I'm mm -hmm. constantly dealing with a question of authorship and I, I really just don't feel like I've ever been able to fully create these images by myself, you know? So it's Excuse harder me, by the way, about the Duchamp re reference and then we have to ask if, open it to a few other questions from other people, but uh, many of your of your magazine drawings take place in ads for bathroom fixtures and, <laughs> yeah. and people are cleaning toilets. Um, and I was just gonna show 
one of the most amazing ones from the Hockney series. This is again from the Domestic Scenes book, which is available. You can get it. Uh, <laughs> but if you take this was the Hockney painting that you were riffing off of, uh, yeah, painting, and this was your response to it. And again, that kind of that that has little whispers of Duchamp in the background. But David, give us some other questions. Yeah. So um, this is uh, from uh, Christine. Um, at the end, it says, I appreciate this might be too personal, but I'm going to say that in the beginning. <laughs> so it's just as a, 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 an alert. Uh, but she says, uh, I'm so moved by your presentation um, and work. And beyond that, I'm intrigued about your changing relationship with the people whose magazines inspired you in the first instance. Are you in touch? And the twins, I appreciate this. That might be too personal, but these changes over time fascinate. Um, yeah, so I am very much in touch with the family. The children, the twins are now 12. They're in junior high. Um, it's been harder and harder, though. During pandemic, I wasn't able to really see them. And then at the same time, as I'm transitioning, it's been really, really difficult to actually go visit just family in general and people that are very close to. So, yeah, I, I haven't really fully explained or described or visited the kids now, but... Um, those are personal things and I, I don't mind sharing. I, I, again, I, I struggle right now with the idea of who I am as a person sometimes just because it's like, it's so complicated. You know, I, I have to, I can't quote unquote dead name um, myself. Um, so, and I, I, and I, I mean, I, I can't, not in the way that I can't because I, I very much could, but I, I choose what not to What does that mean for you? That. What does dead name mean? So dead naming is a thing that I have now learned as I'm going through my transness. Um, but dead naming is, is a very difficult concept in, in, in trans circles. Um, most people often choose not to be named as their, their birth name or uh, accept any version of their previous lives and previous genders that they were assigned at birth. Um, so oftentimes when I've been publicly now speaking about my artwork, I've been asked about that. Or, you know, there's been times when somebody will referenced me, Ramiro Gomez, in the past, and I, I've chosen, and I've literally explained to people who are like, hey, how, how dare you dead name them or her? And it, I, you know, I just, I'm realizing this is a hard thing that I'm trying to like simplify for most people, but it's my reality and I can, ex I have to accept it. Um, so anyway, that, that is, that is basically that in a nutshell. It's, it, it, I'm in touch with them. Um, and I'm trying to navigate a world where like then the subject matter, the figures, yes, some of the nannies that I worked with are still very much in my life. Uh, a lot of the people that I gave paintings to, for example, in the series where I give paintings and gift to paintings, they're all people that have my paintings, but again, they're also ephemeral moments in time. I don't live in Miami Beach, so I can't see every person that I gave some painting to at the Miami Beach Convention Center during our puzzle, but some of them are on Facebook and I still live you know, connected to them or um, each of them, each of the paintings I was given, giving were dated and signed and all that stuff for their own provenance, if you will. Um, but other people, like again, when I feature some of the, the nannies and people that I've worked around, um, they just, for me, it becomes like the artwork is a way to kind of bond us, you know? And oftentimes I, I really don't know how to describe this part, but I really don't know where the paintings are gonna end up. Um, so it's pretty much impossible to kind of keep in touch with everybody, but I, I do want to navigate a world where like at least this will bond maybe generationally. I don't know. I mean, if in the future, somebody's child who I gave a painting to or somebody's child who I featured their parent in my magazine painting or my canvas painting comes back and is like, oh my gosh, like this artist created a painting about my you know, my mom, again, in the case of the janitor at the Denver Art Museum, you know, her daughter's growing. So it's a strange thing to enact, but I, that's how I'll answer that question is that like, I, I, I very much try to keep in touch with most people, but it's it's harder and harder. Over it years. occurs to me, by the way, that the situation of explaining what you're going through right now to 12 and 13 year old boys who you were the nanny to a male nanny in a maternal role may be a location for you to probe a little bit in terms of 
how to turn things into art. I mean, it, 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 it could be very interesting. I don't know. I No, honestly, Red, I, I think about that because nobody, and, and I mean nobody, but there was people around my life, obviously. I mean, nobody like in this art world and all these people weren't around when I was babysitting. So all this artwork was created during a period where only like my family, my partner, David, and other people were closely intimate that were hearing me out, trying to process these things. I mean, again, I didn't just arrive at this idea of creating this magazine series. There is rough sketches. There is real experiences that I lived that got me to where I was. And then you bring up Charlie and my galleries that I'm working with. Yeah, I've, that's exactly what I've told them lately is like, just give me time to kind of process this because I do want to probe those issues. You know, what does it mean to be a former male nanny to, you know, now children that are teenagers and like engaging with them about these issues generationally, these are things hidden, you know, maybe that's- Themselves are going through transitions right now, by the way. Yeah, I, I think well, a lot a 13 year old boy is going through a transition. You know? Correct. And honestly, that's sometimes how I feel. I feel like I'm back in teenage years. Um, but it, it, it's helping that society as a whole is coming out more and more with these issues on the surface. There's entertainment industry people, there's actors and actresses that are coming out now uh, as trans and that helps move the pendulum little by little. And I, I just feel like as an artist, something like this, I don't take lightly to be able to be a face in a period of time when, of course, I'd rather hide and not talk to people, but I, I know it's not, it's not healthy society wise to, to keep these things I should hidden. say that that I really personally, and by the way, let's take one or two more questions, but I personally appreciate that this may be the first time you've publicly come out in terms of talking with people that you've been kind of laying low and, and it was very, I appreciate you doing it with us. But anyway, yeah. any other questions, David? Yeah, um, there's, uh, well, there's, I'm trying to follow here, but there's one um, uh, about the moment when you, described uh, that when you first started, uh, you wanted to put something out uh, and you started doing the cardboard and the fact that it, the, just the kind of immediacy of the fact that there was, there were no walls, there were only hedges. And so then you, um, you ended up doing standing, you know, they had to be freestanding pieces because they had to stand the cardboard pieces. And it, it, it they're curious about that, you know, relative to the switch from the magazine, the smaller magazine parts. Um, yeah, it's it's ingenuity. Honestly, it's the response. And I always am responding. Ironically, in the magazine series, I already start with a with a composition. The photograph is there and the magazine is there. And I just I kind of read the magazine composition, the picture of whatever location, whatever home, whatever interior or exterior that all starts dictating. If I'm going through the magazine series and I see an image of a, you know, a beautiful lawn with a home in the back, sometimes I immediately see it. You know, sometimes I just like, oh, I know exactly where that garden is gonna go. So I rip it out and then I immediately paint. Other times I think about it and I rip the magazine and then leave the magazine there for a little bit. And what maybe I originally thought of doesn't really come out when I force myself to sit in front of the magazine. So I'm always responding. And ingenuity is part of my creative process. So then if I do that with a magazine series in person, I'm doing the same thing. I actually make the painting, the cardboard painting first before going and understanding where it's going to be installed. So I never in the cardboard cutout project go first and like site visit and say, okay, this is, this is how this is going to go. And I'm going to do this. No, I create the, I'll take a photo sometimes of a gardener or I might be working from spaces like, you know, again, if I'm a nanny at the time, babysitting with somebody, I've already made a mental picture, a mental note of somebody that I paint. Uh, and then I make the cardboard cutout. But then once I go <clears throat> to the location, then I have to realize, okay, where do I put this? What time of day is it? The sun is coming from the West over here, right? So where, if it's, if it's sometime in the afternoon and the sun is starting to set, where do I place it so that this is the best possible picture? That I'm going to eventually take because again I, I do take a photo that I share on social media and then meanwhile I started at first with a wire behind the cardboard cutouts against the hedges and that was hard because the hedges would drop the wire so the little by little the cardboard cutout would like droop down on the hedge if I just put it up against the hedge so then the uh, the necessity was how do I get these to freestand so I decided to get wood stakes from gardening uh shops and then I tape 
a spine and that's what I hammer in from behind to kind of give the invisibility aspect of like, you know, I, I usually try to hide the, the stake. Other times there's no hiding it. And so if you're driving by in person and see the cardboard cut out, you'll see it swaying, you'll see it moving. And then if it's there a couple of days, it'll probably droop down and fall eventually. Like there's all those elements. Again, that's the, the image, the photograph is a constructive version of it, right? The, the one moment where it's like, okay, it's up, it's perfect. Um, but then the reality of the piece is different. And again, if there's rain, I've been in situations where some of my cutouts have rain damage. So like I've gone back and I've seen it still standing, but it's drooped because the tape came out because of the rain. And I, I leave it, I let it be, you know, I, I don't feel the need to go back and like fix it or anything like that. And oftentimes if it does end up in say the trash can, it's, it's the symbolism of that awareness that I, makes me excited by, you know? Um, there's a, one, another comment and then one more question. It says, uh, to me, it's poignant to observe that the little girl's dress is too big for her. I'm pretty sure this is referring to the, the janitor's <laughs> daughter in the, <laughs> the opening. Uh, the implication <laughs> is that the dress was not originally hers, a commentary on people who are less fortunate financially. Um, and someone is saying, I love your work. Thank you. Have you had dialogues with Paul Smith? Interestingly, yes and no, I have. But ironically, um, I'm more connected to the managers and the workers at Paul Smith than Paul Smith, sir. Paul, or I don't know. Is, if he is a sir, I don't know. Paul Smith, I don't engage with regularly. It's through the managers. There was a time I was visiting the Paul, Paul Smith, Smith store. Paul Smith is the pink, the pink store. The designer behind the pink walls, iconic facade here in Los Angeles. Um, actually, Paul Smith was inspired by Luis Barragan's architecture, ironically. So that was their goal for this store here in Los Angeles, uh, was like a Luis Barragan-esque building. And meanwhile, I live two blocks down with my ex, uh, with now my ex-partner, but David Feldman, uh, we, I used to go in that neighborhood all the time walking around. So I, I would literally live a block away, two blocks away, come over there and then walk into the store. So there has been times when he's been in the store and I've just casually met him and talked to him. Um, but no, I, I'm more connected to all the workers for him. You know, um, most of them came to my show in 2019. Uh, after I've gotten to know them, they came to my show in 2019 and I featured the manager uh, of, the, of the store here in Los Angeles, uh, Jose, in a painting. And I featured the person that I showed in the, in the presentation painting the wall. Um, his name's Luna. And I featured him in a painting with Jose. So both the manager and the painter are together in a portrait that I made in my show in 2019 at Charlie And as Jane. I recall, there was a drop cloth that you featured. And there was a drop cloth version of the Paul Smith that is not in the slide, but yeah, like, I've painted them several times and I'm very much in touch. Um, I've also painted the security guard that has to work every day to keep that pink wall sort of like protected from all the selfie takers because there's a lot of Instagram and social media selfie takers for it. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, I, I do keep in touch with all of those more than Paul Smith, but who knows? I mean, again, I, I, I was never about, you know, trying to connect to the, the name. And again, that's part of what I would, talked about in the presentation, people recognize Paul Smith, but there's so many people that are working for Paul Smith. So I wanted to, that's where I, I go with my artwork oftentimes. It's like, yes, you recognize the logo, you recognize the brand and the person is famous, but there's so many not famous people that work for him and create the Paul Smith brand, you know? Your mention of the selfies just by way of conclusion. <laughs> the one with, oh in, guys. In, 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 the, in the domestic scenes book. I have a photograph that I, some photographs that I was taking of David Hockney <laughs> as you were showing him things that you had done. And there the meta ran. And, and then my favorite part is that, first of all, he immediately took you aside and started teaching you about Frangelico. Remember, he was doing a whole I remember thing. that. And Ren, honestly, and then, you and then the me. best part was I had it, I wanted to take a picture of the two of you. And, I, and you were standing there and I was being a little bit slow taking the picture and you both realized that you could both take selfies with your own phone and that you didn't need me. And here's a picture of you and David Hockney <laughs> taking selfies with each other that I took you, captured you at that moment. But anyway. The I book, love that, Ren. I remember, it, honestly, yeah, 
seeing how he worked with technology, I identified immediately. I felt like a kid in, in a playground with him, you know? Right. And right. like us both going through the the phones and the iPads. And ironically, when you're talking about the Frangelico book, he could have just showed me on the iPad the, the Frangelico work and reference that he was trying to give me. But because I told him I wasn't as familiar, he physically got up to get that big book out and sit there with <laughs> while you, everyone else was talking at the table. And it was just me and him in a private conversation about Frangelico and he's physically showing me. Yeah, I, I, didn't, think, <laughs> I didn't take that lightly. <laughs> so people seriously, I think, by the way, this book has even been remaindered, so you can get it like for a dollar online, which is kind yeah. of crazy. But it's called Domestic Scenes, and it's the art of Ramiro Gomez, and it's the first volume of what I hope will be another vo another volume at some point about things coming forward. Exactly, Ren. Anyway, well, listen. Thank you. Jay, this has been really wonderful. You've been extraordinarily generous. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you, everybody. I think we'll have a few more things before this is over, and we'll let you know about it as we as things go along. Thank, thank you, you so much, uh, Jaylen. Wonderful to have you. And, uh, thank you, Ron. Thank you to the even to the people that I wasn't able to answer their questions. I'm sure eventually they might find us on social media or something. But like, yeah, I'm open to talking about these issues with people if they wanted to find a little on you know social media and stuff. So wonderful, fantastic. Thank you so much. Good Bye, night, everyone. All right, goodbye, everybody. See you soon.